Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our FPCI ambassadorial lecture in cooperation with the delegation of the European Union to Indonesia. My name is Avni, and I will be the moderator for today's event. Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia has the pleasure to once again conduct this lecture series throughout 2021. And today we have here with us His, His Excellency Vincent Piquet, Ambassador of the European Union to Indonesia. Welcome, Ambassador. Thank you, Terimikasi. Today, we are also joined by students from 12 universities across Indonesia, which are Universitas Gajah Mada, yeah, 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 yeah. Universitas Indonesia, Universitas Islam Negeri Syarif Hidayatullah Jakarta, President University, Universitas General Sudirman, UPN Veteran Jawa Timur, Binus University, Universitas 17 Agustus 1945, Universitas Airlangga, Universitas Pajajaran, Universitas Brawijaya, and last, Universitas Pelita Harapan. Welcome everybody, and also thank you to our participants for tuning in on our YouTube channel. Ladies and gentlemen, this ambassadorial lecture series aims to discuss various aspects of the bilateral relations between Indonesia and the European Union, especially during this unprecedented time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we will have an update from the European Union and its foreign policy outlook delivered by Ambassador Picat. Before we start, don't forget to share your moment with us from this lecture by tagging at FPSC Indo and at uni underscore Europa on your social media posts. Ladies and gentlemen, let us now begin today's discussion. Ambassador Vincent Picat, the floor is yours. Terima kasih banyak, Ibu Afni, for the welcome and for the introduction. And terima kasih banyak to all participants uh, in this uh, uh, this webinar. Uh, joining in from from twelve uh, universities, that's not nothing. Um, from all across uh, uh, Java, uh, Jakarta, uh, Yogyakarta, Malang, uh, Surabaya, Bandung, uh, I believe, and um, and maybe others that I haven't managed to catch. Uh, but it's it's a great pleasure to to be reaching out uh, to you this afternoon in this way, not a physical visit. I would love to uh, come into your universities, each and every one of them. Um, but for now, we have to settle for this, uh, this uh, virtual platform. Terimikasi um, Banyak also to FPCI, uh, our uh, fantastic partner here in Indonesia, uh, a great network of uh, uh, young people um, who are enthusiastic uh, for international relations, who are studying it in most cases, and uh, who possibly may find their future employment uh, in this area of work um, as a professional diplomat or uh, working in large companies that uh, rely on um, um, analyses and intelligence about uh, international relations, political, economic trade, uh, what have you. Uh, so it's uh, it's great uh, to be working with FPCI to be able to make a little contribution from the side of uh, the European Union, from the side of um, uh, the delegation of the European Union, the diplomatic mission that uh, represents the European Union here in Indonesia. Now the uh, you you may know that uh, the EU's uh, delegation in Jakarta, of course, does not work on its own. Uh, it uh, works uh, together 
uh, with uh, the embassies of the, uh, the European Union member states uh, in uh, Indonesia and in, based in Jakarta. There are uh, 20 of them. Uh, so uh, we have uh, uh, 20 member states out of the 27 total EU member states um, represented here in Indonesia, which means that we have a fantastic critical mass of uh, European presence um, um, here, uh, with which we, of course, uh, work hard to uh, promote the relations with uh, Indonesia. In my case, also uh, Brunei Darussalam, where I'm credited uh, uh, on a non residence basis, and, um, and also the relations with, um, with ASEAN. Um, in the delegation uh, of the EU here in Jakarta, uh, we have next next to me, uh, working side by side, also a self-standing ambassador accredited to ASEAN uh, to promote specifically the EU-ASEAN relations, which are extremely important and have been growing quite um, quite a lot uh, over the last uh, uh, five years or so. Um, I've been in Indonesia for a year and a half, good year and a half. Um, much of it was, of course, uh, colored uh, by the COVID um, pandemic, um, colored in exactly the same way as it is uh, for, for you, students. Um, and uh, of course, we've had to adapt the way we work. Uh, but on the whole, I believe that we have been able to maintain and sustain and even expand um, in some areas uh, the cooperation with uh, with Indonesia uh, quite well. Now, <clears throat> you invited me to speak about uh, um, the outlook of foreign policy um, terms um, uh, of the European Union. Now, of course, an outlook um, is looking into the future and uh, <laughs> uh, any diplomat uh, who talks about the future will uh, start with a uh, disclaimer, with a note of caution saying that the future is very unpredictable. Um, a year ago, um, we could not have predicted uh, what the world um, would be like uh, right now uh, with this, uh, this tremendous uh, pandemic um, hitting us all uh, in terms of lively, lives lost, um, in terms of uh, economic damage, social damage, and um, in terms of a test uh, that the pandemic has put uh, for the multilateral system of responding uh, to this global crisis. Looking into the future in, uh, in foreign policy is necessary. Um, you have to work with scenarios uh, of what may happen, uh, how to respond to those, but um, uh, in any scenario, there is uh, likely to be a high element of risk. Now, that, that is in itself already an important observation to make when you talk about uh, the outlook, uh, the foreign policy outlook of the uh, EU, because uh, that foreign policy outlook has been very much um, affected and has to respond uh, to a change in the, in a multilateral uh, order uh, in in the world, um, we all believe in multilateralism in the EU. Uh, many other, most other countries around the world, so too, and um, and especially in in a time of of headwinds of hardship um, uh, like we have now, uh, it is an essential part of our of our vision of the of the world. Now, the multilateral order was, was very much tested and um, also because naturally, as we all know, uh, the previous US administration um, uh, took a distance from it and uh, sided itself from, from some of the multilateral lessons uh, that we had come to believe. New administration in the US, the US and um, which has a different policy, and we therefore feel that 
we have a, a real opportunity uh, to uh, work uh, with the US and with others uh, for the revival uh, of the multilateral system in this uh, very uh, complex um, world. Um, that's not going to be an easy task um, because uh, at the end of the day, there are differences all over the world um, about how uh, to rebuild uh, the multilateral system. And, um, and that is because next to multilateralism, we have a, a multipolar uh, reality uh, with different blocks, with different um, major powers, uh, world powers, um, uh, pursuing uh, interests uh, that are more mostly related to them. And uh, that, of course, puts a tremendous uh, stress on uh, the multilateral system and on their ability of those countries to contribute uh, uh, to, us, to it. Um, it has an important implication from, uh, for, for, for Europe, for the EU, um, because it means that we and others who are, remain strongly attached to the multilateral system, we will have to work harder on it um, uh, to counter the risks and the downsides of the multipolarity of the world order as we see it happen as well. We have to deal with the fact that uh, some of the major issues, major problems uh, in the world, some of the interests in the world are handled in a much more what is called transactional uh, way, in uh, a part of a more transactional world of deal making um, at the expense, in some cases, of uh, the um, uh, multilateral interests, of, of, at the expense sometimes of countries that are not part of the deal. Um, so it means for the European Union and as well as for some others uh, that we will have to throw much more political weight um, uh, behind multilateralism than, than we used to. And we will have to um, be ready uh, to more strongly, more vigorously uh, def defend the interests of ours uh, in that connection and uh, in order to um, uh, try and realize uh, our, our goals. Uh, we cannot anymore, as we used to, we cannot uh, anymore rely on the sheer moral weight, on the sheer ideological weight uh, of the argument. Uh, the sheer value uh, uh, that certain things are better. Uh, than other things. Uh, no, sometimes we have to have a, make a heavy push uh, for such uh, values. One example is, uh, for instance, just one example, is that um, our attachment to, to borders, uh, sovereignty of borders, and uh, which is a legal and political principle, Yet, we have seen in the recent past, in the Crimea, uh, that uh, territory was uh, annexed uh, in a, a non-legal way or in a way that was incompatible with uh, the international order. Now, in such a situation, the EU and others uh, were forced to uh, issue sanctions uh, against uh, the Russian uh, um, power structure, structures in order to turn that reality of annexation back. Um, sanctions uh, to try to enforce uh, rules, um, regulations, international rules, multilateral rules that used to be normal and accepted for everyone, uh, but um, clearly in recent past were not. So, being multilateral in a multipolar world is a um, uh, today uh, a, a, a uh, involves a, an extra challenge, and uh, we are struck um, each and every day, each and every week, 
with the need to strike a balance between uh, the multilateral mechanisms and tools um, with the fact that we live in this uh, very complex uh, situation of multipolar uh, 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 powers and power blocks. Um, and the thing is that um, it's not exactly the same always whether you look at it from an economic point of view and uh, from a political point of view. Now, economically, um, the biggest blocks in the world are uh, economies in the world are um, the United States, uh, China, and uh, the European Union. Um, all three, um, roughly the same uh, levels of GDP and roughly the same share in, uh, in the global uh, trade. Um, However, uh, politically, uh, the situation is different uh, than the economic uh, situation where you have this trio of, uh, of powers. And politically, of course, between these three, there's two dominant uh, among them, and that is China and the United States. And uh, we have seen over the past uh, couple of years, very much this uh, the Sino-American um, uh, um, bipolarity um, define uh, in many ways um, the um, this scene and the context uh, for global politics. Um, a second realization is that um, notwithstanding the um, uh, uh, the size of the economies of uh, China, US and uh, EU. Um, there are also other powers um, who have been um, in the multipolar uh, context been very prominent with policies of their own. And um, uh, without themselves necessarily being strong economically. And the example is uh, again, uh, Russia uh, and um, at a regional level, uh, also a country like Turkey. Um, and because there are actors um, like us, um, and uh, there are who have a strong economic weight without a, a, a having a strong uh, political weight uh, necessarily, uh, in, in the world or military weight in the world, uh, we have to uh, resort to uh, other means of policy making in the foreign arena than, than other countries. And, and in, in many ways, you can say that, uh, that for the European Union, uh, the task in the present period and looking ahead is very much to how to bridge how to, to close that gap between our economic power and our um, geopolitical influence. Um, so you will read at the moment um, in Europe a lot of uh, about the discussion about uh, um, um, assertiveness in foreign poli policy, uh, about uh, resilience as European Union in, uh, in uh, the foreign uh, policy arena um, and um, about um, what is called strategic autonomy, uh, which is a, uh, um, a different way of expressing uh, resilience, um, but more uh, as a uh, conscious and purposeful uh, foreign policy. Um, tool, and um, and all of that uh, are, are notions that uh, are um, uh, not in contradiction with uh, our uh, attachment to multilateralism, uh, but rather we would say uh, those notions are in defense of our interests, and one of these interests is um, multilateralisms, and we need to employ uh, such tools in order to uh, uh, preserve and promote uh, the multilateral goals. Um, 
and instruments. And that's maybe an important thing to stress as well, that multilateralism is in itself not a, um, an ideology. It's not a, um, a, uh, um, a, a political goal in itself. It's a methodology. It's a tool. It's a, a tool that uh, regulates uh, world relations um, based on stable, mutually or internationally agreed rules, uh, transparent rules, uh, enforceable rules um, um, that apply to everybody, uh, to all, uh, regardless of the size of, uh, of, uh, of the country or of the region. So you can be a large country um, and, um, and you can be a small country, but uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, multilateral order, multilateral rules protect uh, you in exactly uh, the same way and the rules for everybody are the same. Um, so multilateralism is not a magic wand. It's not uh, something that has come out of the air uh, just like that. Uh, it's a tool that we have built up uh, over the over the past uh, 50 to 70 years and uh, that um, we um, now need to uh, keep in place uh, to um, uh, work further uh, for uh, the global goods. Um, the very good examples are, uh, for instance, the WTO. Um, it's a, an organization set up in various uh, uh, phases uh, with uh, uh, the, uh, of course, the current treaty uh, being very much inspired by multilateralism and by the creation of um, stable rules for trade, for investment, for intellectual property um, that uh, benefit world trade um, and uh, that benefit world trade um, for everybody because that is the whole notion about it, that in order to make world trade happen and to open borders for trade, you have to make sure that you have built in rules that protect uh, certain interests and that guarantee um, um, fair competition and a level playing field um, for all countries that, uh, that trade. Now, that WTO mechanism is under severe pressure, uh, has been, um, especially uh, also because of the attitude taken by the former US uh, administration, um, but not only because of that, uh, also because uh, the, uh, some of the rules under the uh, WT, uh, WTO uh, have simply been uh, somewhat, uh, become somewhat outdated. And particularly at the, uh, the problem of subsidization of the economy. That is something that um, um, uh, the Chinese case shows it, that uh, the WTO uh, for the time being has not uh, catered for um, uh, appropriately. So the reform of this multilateral uh, tool of the WTO uh, will require adjustments um, to uh, uh, correct uh, those imbalances. Um, that's one example. Another example is the, the climate dialogue and the climate objective. At the end of this year, we will have uh, the, um, the COP26, uh, where all global partners will come together uh, to look at what was realized thanks to the uh, uh, the 2015 Paris Agreement, um, where all global partners will be uh, asked to put more commitments on the table uh, for um, making sure that uh, the targets um, agreed in Paris uh, can be met. And because one thing is clear right now that uh, Paris, as it stands, uh, will not keep um, climate warming, global warming to acceptable levels, uh, minus one and a half 
uh, or maximum two degrees uh, Celsius. Now, raising commitment in the COP26 in Glasgow is, of course, one thing, but you have to then implement it back home. And, uh, and everybody has to do that in their way. The Europe, Europe, the EU has its way. We call it the Green Deal. Uh, and it is our policy to make our um, economy, our society truly carbon neutral and circular. Uh, by the year 2050. Um, it does involve major cuts in uh, CO2 emissions in our economies. It does necessitate major investment by firms in their production uh, processes, in the way we generate uh, uh, electricity, in the way we uh, uh, transport ourselves, um, uh, heat our houses and uh, um, uh, or cool our houses <laughs> in some parts of the year. Uh, and um, so for that reason, we will have to ask a lot of uh, effort from our economies, but we can do that only if such an effort by the EU firms, by the EU countries, is matched or mirrored um, also by efforts from abroad. Um, and very concretely here, uh, we have to avoid that while we cut CO2, um, other regions, other countries happily continue um, uh, producing CO2 and uh, gain an unfair economic um, um, advantage. Um, now, for that reason, the EU will be discussing this year a um, what is called a carbon border adjustment mechanism, um, which is <coughs> meant to um, um, make it make impossible to have what we call carbon leakage. Uh, in other words, uh, import of carbon uh, uh, to um, uh, by firms that have an unfair comparative advantage um, for our industry. Now, that is in, in principle a great idea, um, I would say, but of course we have to make sure that we realize such an idea um, in, that, in a way that is compatible uh, with the WTO, um, in a way that um, um, does not mean that it would be causing a, um, a, uh, an element or a, a measure of protectionism uh, of the European continent um, against um, uh, uh, firms from outside. It is not such a mechanism, a protection mechanism, but uh, countries may see it as that. And of course, we have to um, take that into account. Um, so two very concrete examples, I think, of how the multilateral system um, um, has, uh, on, on the one hand, has to be reconciled or matched uh, with multipolar measures, with multipolar um, drives, uh, whether it's the European Union um, um, acting or whether it's, um, it's, it's others. Um, what is going to be very important in the coming um, period for us, uh, but also for others, is, is to seek uh, partnerships. If on, in the past, uh, the multilateral system stood there, it was, and it was very easy, relatively speaking, to, uh, to strike partnerships and find consensus amongst groups of countries. Um, in the multipolar system, that is going to be much tougher. Not impossible, of course, but much tougher and more effort uh, has to be put into it. And that uh, means very much that the European Union uh, will be aiming to strike those partnerships um, uh, on um, different topics uh, all across 
the world, all around the globe. And, um, and the public, anybody, it can be sovereign countries, um, but it also can be uh, regional entities like the African Union, um, uh, like ASEAN um, and other regional configurations. Um, only with partnerships on that basis um, formed along uh, uh, reciprocal interest or common interest, uh, will it be possible uh, to uh, promote your, uh, your goals and your interests? So um, we will be looking around the world for possibilities to partner. And uh, I will come to that in a second. Um, in more detail, but certainly we will be looking to Asia uh, and in particular to ASEAN and in particular also to Indonesia uh, for um, <coughs> uh, doing precisely that. Um, but before turning to, to Asia, uh, a word about other key partnerships uh, on uh, um, on the, uh, uh, that we need to consider. Um, at the very start of my talk, I, um, I mentioned uh, the United States and evidently uh, with uh, the new administration in office, um, there is an absolutely great opportunity uh, for us to, uh, uh, to revive uh, the very long-standing um, transatlantic relations uh, that we've had with the United States uh, ever since the Second World War. It was very deep um, and very strong and very broad. And of course, has a very important um, uh, security dimension uh, as well. But the previous four years weren't easy. And, uh, and we are now very happy to see a, a different climate and if different um, uh, opportunity uh, for um, reviving that partnership. Um, it's not going to be easy because uh, there are uh, uh, differences of opinion about some topics, but, but still, uh, just over the past couple of weeks, there has been tremendous progress. And I'll just give you the examples. Um, in, in the last month, um, the United States and uh, the EU have have uh, uh, stopped uh, these punitive uh, tariff measures uh, over the quarrel we had uh, about subsidies to Boeing and subsidies to Airbus. Uh, this was a long-standing debate fought out at the WTO, um, very damaging for both sides and certainly damaging uh, for the consumers. But uh, last 10 days ago, uh, both sides agreed uh, to do away with those punitive measures and to try and sort the problem in a different way. Um, the second very concrete result was um, uh, on trade, um, and that is that uh, the US and the EU agreed uh, the new quotas uh, uh, for agricultural trade. Now, this was something that was would have been totally impossible uh, um, uh, two months ago, uh, but um, less than two months into the new administration in the US, we have cleared that hurdle. Um, and the third example uh, I want to mention is that um, two weeks ago in Brussels, we had the visit uh, by, uh, the, um, by John Kerry, uh, who is the, um, the special climate envoy appointed by President Biden. Uh, he met in Brussels with all the foreign ministers of the EU. He visited several capitals. And of course, uh, most important is what uh, John Kerry told uh, the EU. And what he's told us is that the, the uh, United States is back on board uh, the climate, the multilateral climate agenda, and will be pursuing a very uh, ambitious um, uh, carbon cutting uh, agenda. Um, 
uh, inside the US that match very much um, uh, the carbon uh, policy of, uh, of the European Union. Three very concrete achievements that um, the two polars uh, of the United States and the EU managed to agree in only a very short while. And we are determined to, to pursue that sort of um, momentum in all other topics as well. And one of them is evidently also COVID, on which there are countless exchanges uh, happening between uh, us and, uh, and Washington uh, presently. Um, I've mentioned Russia. And Russia, of course, is our, our big neighbor uh, to our east. It is um, a two and a half hour flight from Brussels. Um, so uh, uh, rel it's considered relatively distant uh, in Europe, but for an Indonesian, a two and a half hour flight domestic flight is not that much. Um, so it is uh, fair, at the same time, a very close um, neighbor um, um, on our eastern side. Um, Russia is, from what I can see, I was for four years, um, definitely European in vocation. Um, and it is Asian when it suits. Um, it, um, but um, certainly uh, we see Russia as a historical and geographic um, partner uh, for many, many reasons indeed. Uh, cultural reasons are there too, of course. And we want to engage uh, with Russia and um, it's, would, it's very unnatural not to do so for us. However, um, many major problems are um, right now on our agenda. I've mentioned the, uh, the annexation of, uh, of the Crimea. Um, uh, it's part of the Russian policy in mixing in the Ukraine um, uh, domestic affairs. Um, we have suffered cyber attacks um, uh, originating from Russia, nobody knows exactly from where, but um, um, but um, they were well, well orchestrated. Um, and we have major human rights worries um, uh, regarding Russia. And the most recent one is, of course, um, the um, uh, imprisonment of uh, um, Mr. Navalny uh, upon his return uh, to Moscow after having been treated uh, in Berlin uh, for uh, a poisoning attempt, um, uh, um, murder attempt against him. So for that reason, the EU has decided to put in place sanctions against some of the Russian leaders and uh, to, in order to um, uh, ask them forcefully uh, to change uh, their policy. And pending that, it's, it's sorry to say, sad to say in a way, it's very hard to see how our relations with Russia uh, can take a turn for the better. And um, uh, these fundamental matters, fundamental matters need to be addressed. Uh, the EU uh, High Representative for Foreign and Security Policy, Josep Borrell, he traveled off to Moscow um, four weeks ago. He tried to do precisely that, uh, but uh, the answer that came back uh, was a, fl a flat negative. Uh, so we are stuck here uh, over very fundamental rule of law, multilateral order issues um, that need to be solved before um, the, uh, the EU can, uh, can re-engage uh, with, uh, with Russia. And uh, so that is, if you, um, for our outlook uh, for the coming couple of years, certainly a major issue on our agenda. 
um, Indo-Pacific region. Um, now, uh, this is, of course, a region that uh, whose importance politically, economically, um, uh, has been rising very, very fast over the past 30, 40 years, uh, with China uh, a major engine uh, of, uh, of economic growth, um, but also elsewhere um, in Southeast Asia, and particularly, uh, we have a uh, uh, tremendous increasing weight uh, of the economies. We have very long-standing partnerships in the Asia-Pacific, uh, uh, Indo-Pacific region with Japan, with the uh, South Korea, with Australia, New Zealand. Um, and uh, we will, of course, uh, very much cherish those partnerships in the multipolar um, configuration. China is for everybody, uh, including the EU, of course, a tremendously important partner uh, for the developing uh, relations with. And, um, but it's a very complex relationship at the same time. Uh, sometimes China is a partner, uh, sometimes it's a competitor, and sometimes it's a rival. Um, um, security terms or in terms of ideology and uh, the human rights um, agenda. So if you want to engage China, uh, you cannot uh, ignore that complexity and engage we must. So uh, in our engagement, we have to make sure uh, that we balance out these three um, identities of China, partner, competitor and arrival um, uh, carefully. Um, in other words, we call it engagement uh, with wide open eyes. Um, now this discussion about that goes to the, uh, to the top of the EU decision-making process uh, next week. Uh, I suggest you follow that a little bit. Uh, the 26th of March, uh, the um, European Council, um, that is to say the heads of state and the heads of government of the uh, 27 member states, plus the council president and the European Commission president and uh, high representative Joseph Borrell, uh, will be discussing China, among other topics, will be discussing China um, uh, in the European Council. How to define ourselves, our goals and our mode uh, towards uh, China. Um, the, um, this is going to be a very demanding agenda uh, with balancing our own interests, economic values, uh, human rights, uh, with uh, the need for partnering China in all areas where we can, um, and particularly, of course, um, in the area of, uh, of the global climate agenda, as well as security. Um, in the Indo-Pacific region, of course, also India, um, a, a partner where we have had uh, relations that have existed for decades. But if we are very honest with ourselves, then um, the uh, relations between the EU and India have not um, uh, not reached uh, their potential. They've been below potential, if you like. Now, we feel that there is a new dynamic um, in the relations with India. And, um, and in other words, uh, we have an opportunity to um, give it a, a push and to do a number of things that have been on the agenda uh, for a long time, but impossible to achieve. Um, now, partly, of course, this has to do also with um, the fact that India's perspective, perspective is changing somewhat. Um, India sees, like us, uh, India sees uh, the rise of China and the need to engage with uh, other partners, particularly the EU. 
uh, to uh, balance that out. Um, uh, before Brexit, uh, of course, for India, UK was a very handy and easily accessible way into the European Union. Um, Brexit has happened, so we, for India to engage with the EU, it cannot use the, the London door any longer, but has to uh, do more with, uh, with, with Europe. And uh, so from their side, also a new motivation uh, for engaging with us. And, and that's what we hope to do uh, in the coming year or years um, in very different and important areas, whether it is connectivity, whether it is the uh, digital economy, uh, the climate and um, um, dialogue and agenda, uh, the clean energy agenda, um, as well as security and, uh, and foreign policy. And on foreign policy, of course, India will be um, in the uh, Security Council this year and the next. And uh, it's on the Human Rights Council. And um, in 2023, it will be the uh, hold the G20 presidency succeeding uh, Indonesia. So China uh, is one large partner in the Indo-Pacific, but India certainly uh, um, will figure equally prominently for us in the coming uh, years. And that, I think I can also say about ASEAN. Um, ASEAN, of course, uh, compare, if you compare it to the EU, if you look at the ASEAN Charter, uh, and compare it with the EU treaty, uh, then of course the EU treaty is more detailed, is maybe more advanced. The principles, the important political drives, the motivations, they are very, very comparable. Um, uh, we are like-minded if it comes to our um, uh, birthrights, and if it comes to our um, founding treaties, and our fundamental goals. Um, for that reason, we were very happy la that last December, December 2020, the EU and um, uh, ASEAN um, agreed to set up a strategic partnership uh, between the two, two of us. And that's an important step forward. Uh, it raises the dialogue uh, uh, between us. Uh, it implies uh, new commitments uh, to seek um, bilateral and uh, solutions that are mutually shared and reciprocal uh, and that relations that build not only the bilateral relationship but also um, are aimed at strengthening uh, the uh, multilateral order. So that is very important. So we look forward very much to giving that shape in the coming years, um, seeking out uh, our mutual strategic interests um, in security, in foreign policy, um, in the economy, and in um, a host of policy areas um, where that bring us together. For instance, customs, transport, aviation, uh, connectivity, um, education, research, and of course, health, uh, including uh, COVID. And on that score, just one very good example. Um, the, the EU and ASEAN set up just um, uh, two months ago, uh, still in December last year, two and a half months, um, a, uh, a group of senior experts uh, to talk about the pandemic and to compare notes, uh, compare best practices on how to fight that pandemic and to uh, develop uh, strategies for vaccination, strategies for therapies and, and so on. So and I think that's pretty unique and um, uh, we will be repeating that dialogue in, in the coming months uh, for a second uh, second round. Um, 
So um, ASEAN will figure high on our agenda, and which is a, uh, another way of saying that Indonesia will be figuring high on our agenda too, because within ASEAN, Indonesia is uh, by far the biggest uh, country by population and by size of the economy and in terms of, um, of political weight. Um, so also what I said about India a bit earlier on, uh, in a way it's, it's also a little bit true about the uh, relations between the EU and Indonesia. Uh, they're long-standing and they go back uh, for decades yeah. Uh, they took a very positive turn in the year 2014 uh, when uh, Indonesia was the first Asian country uh, to implement, to start implementing uh, a partnership and cooperation agreement um, with the EU. Um, it shows that already then we had the sense that we were like-minded. Um, the EU and Indonesia have worked hard uh, on uh, together on the SDG agenda uh, with, uh, in the past, a very significant financial support uh, for Indonesia to meet um, uh, the uh, objectives of the SDG agenda. And um, financial support, there is, that's just a parenthesis, there is now less because simply Indonesia has become too rich uh, to be qualify as a um, as a priority a recipient for EU uh, grant aid uh, as an upper middle income middle income upper middle income country. Um, it is no longer in uh, the core of our development policy, um, but that doesn't matter because we have other tools. Uh, one and one of them is trade. We have um, started, as, as you may know, uh, the negotiations for the big free trade agreement. Um, uh, they call it the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. So it's more than trade. It's more than exchanging goods and services. It's more than investment. But it's about a partnership uh, on all policies uh, that support trade and that can bring our economic relations to an, an altogether different level, to a strategic level, I would say. And that is, for us, of course, very important. Um, knowing that where Indonesia wants to go uh, by 2030, uh, realization SDG, and by 2045, uh, be, be a high income country um, and a big one. Um, so that is for us a major interest. And also looking at it from the Indonesian point of view, um, I believe uh, I can say that Indonesia recognizes that the EU is a, an economic partner for the long run. Um, our economic policy is different from any others. Uh, some countries come to Indonesia for a deal uh, for one investment, and, and, and that's it. Uh, no, the EU believes in a developmental uh, trade and eco economic relationship that promotes Indonesia's growth, uh, sustainable growth goal uh, for the medium to long term. And um, that is a, a, um, also um, proven uh, in studies with, that we did. Uh, we have um, the studies uh, have shown that uh, once the, um, uh, the SEPA uh, is up and running fully, it will generate about 5 billion um, euros extra growth for um, extra GDP for Indonesia year after year. So five and a half billion uh, US dollars extra GDP year after year. And GDP growth is good in itself, but it is especially good um, because it translates into employment. It translates into 
uh, wages into wage increases and uh, by doing that it translates into poverty reductions uh, uh, throughout um, the country. I conclude my talk by a brief look at uh, uh, foreign relations closer to home, closer to the EU um, in, uh, in, uh, and with a, um, first of all, a, a word on, on the UK. Um, what an EU member is, is so no more. Brexit has happened. <laughs> and um, we are still in the phase of, um, uh, uh, of accommodation to that reality of um, digesting uh, the new rules that, uh, that are in operation uh, between us and the UK as a non-member. Uh, we've had to, it's the only negotiation, um, trade negotiation um, uh, that rather than eliminating barriers has uh, has aimed at erecting barriers it's not our choice but uh, that was um, uh, the name of the game and um, so we will certainly over the coming um, months still have um, hiccups and uh, disagreements about what to do and how to do it, how to implement the, the, few, uh, the current uh, partnership agreement. Um, you may have read that this week, was last week, last week I think, um, the EU took, um, decided to start a legal proceeding against the UK uh, on account of uh, what we see as a non-compliance with uh, some of the rules. Um, that will go on for a bit, I'm sure. Um, but once that is done, then I'm convinced that um, the UK and the EU will be able to build up a, um, an ex um, a, a very important new bilateral relation. Uh, at the end of the day, we are like-minded in uh, virtually everything in the way we look at the world and uh, the priorities that we have uh, for the world, um, for our own citizens, by the way. The UK is a European country. Um, it takes the same uh, perspectives on, on a global issue like climate change. Um, so we are certain that we can partner very, very strongly with the UK uh, on, for the COP26 in, in November uh, this year in Glasgow. Uh, if you look, compare the UK input uh, for the COP uh, with ours, then uh, you can see that um, it's, it's very similar. Uh, our security interests um, in, uh, are similar uh, in that part of Europe. And, uh, and at the end of the day, our, our, our people interests are, are similar. Um, so many UK nationals have... Uh, uh, houses for, for retirement or for holidays uh, all across uh, the European continent. Uh, they want to go with or without houses. <laughs> they want to go on holiday um, in, um, in in the, Europe, the EU countries. So, and likewise, um, so do the EU citizens, including myself. So that will, of course, be a tremendous driver for the policymakers after. Uh, in, in the medium to longer term uh, to uh, reopen and, and um, revitalize those possibilities for uh, citizens, for companies uh, in a uh, non-membership uh, uh, situation. And my last element is about enlargement, the EU's enlargement policy. Uh, one of the defining policies of, uh, of the EU in the, in the 1990s uh, up to the year 2013, when um, um, 
the most recent enlargement happened uh, with Croatia joining the EU. Now, that period from uh, 19, the middle of the 1990s, let's say, until 2030, um, enlargement was without a doubt uh, the dominant uh, foreign policy uh, of the EU uh, in those days. Uh, this was a, a massive, massive political drive um, at carried at all levels um, in the EU and within all member states and aiming at um, repairing uh, the, the big uh, iron curtain that had hung uh, through Europe uh, after, the, uh, after the Second World War. Um, now, that big political ambition and goal was achieved uh fundamentally not completely but in essence it was and the europe as we know it now um, is radically different um, uh, as from the europe uh, of the uh, the period uh, before now at the same time there are still a number of countries with whom we are negotiating membership or with whom we will uh, negotiate and one of them is Turkey <laughs> that is a uh, probably nothing to do <laughs> with what I was saying but um, but anyhow uh, Turkey uh, uh, um, Negotiations have uh, started in 2005 already, so it's 16 years ago. However, uh, they have, you know, to put it in simple terms, run aground um, over, over political differences. And um, some of these are uh, political, foreign policy differences, security. Um, the most obvious being the fact that um, Turkey has helped the annexation or has annexed uh, part, the northern part of Cyprus. And of course, that is not acceptable uh, for uh, the EU. And um, Turkey has uh, started uh, the exploration of the, uh, the sea floor um, uh, in the economic zone of Cyprus, and that is not something we accept. Um, uh, we also have seen uh, differences between us and Turkey on foreign policy issues, whether it's concerned uh, Syria or uh, Libya in Northern Africa. And, um, and um, and all of these have, have made uh, the membership bid of, of Turkey very difficult indeed. Um, I'm not going into the details, but uh, not, not underestimate also the, uh, the problems that come from the domestic developments inside Turkey on human rights, um, on democracy, on freedom of expression, and um, uh, all very crucial uh, topics for uh, for any member state of the EU uh, um, uh, to meet uh, the EU standards. Um, so all of that is a block of problems. At the same time, um, we also see a vital need uh, to work with Turkey. It is a strategic partner of ours in a, a essential in a part of Europe uh, that is essential for our security and stability, um, for fighting terrorism, um, uh, for the economy. Turkey is quite a large economy. Uh, we have a customs union with Turkey, uh, which is of course a very uh, profound um, economic relationship. And Turkey is doing an, a, a really heroic job on sheltering and hosting uh, millions of, uh, of refugees from Syria. 
uh, at great cost to Turkey itself. Um, and um, and uh, but fortunately, the EU uh, is um, has been supporting uh, Turkey for doing precisely that, uh, and uh, with eight billion euros uh, of humanitarian assistance um, paid by the EU to to Turkey. So, in short, it's a relationship that faces um, tremendous questions at the moment in terms of can we proceed and how fast can we proceed with the um, accession negotiations. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, there is a, uh, uh, for both sides, a tremendous gain to be made if we manage to resolve these political um, uh, problems between us. Um, the last group of countries are the countries of what we call the Western Balkans, um, Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, North Macedonia, uh, Kosovo, um, Montenegro and, uh, and Serbia. Uh, now, most of these countries are already in a process of negotiation. Uh, with for membership with the EU, um, Albania, Albania is, uh, North Macedonia is, uh, Montenegro is, and Serbia is. So four of them, uh, and there's still two countries that are not yet there, and that is um, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and um, and Kosovo. Um, now, the negotiations will uh, take time. Uh, the sense we have is that even though the countries are making progress in, um, in their re internal reforms and in their preparations for membership, um, there's still a long way to go, uh, both in meeting the technical requirements uh, that you need to fulfill in order to be able to join the European Union but also in terms of the more political um, um, and readiness and security readiness um, that uh, uh, are uh, at stake. Uh, the institutional capacity, uh, strength of government uh, system, of democracy, of the courts system, um, transparency um, uh, matters, so, um, capability of managing money transparently. All of these are major reforms that all countries still need to make progress on. Um, so membership is a promise, uh, but uh, it is a promise that has to be won um, over time by these reforms. And, but of course, from the EU point of view, um, this is a part of, uh, of Europe uh, that is essential for our security and for uh, connecting uh, that part, um, uh, the, the northern part of Europe uh, uh, with uh, Greece and Cyprus. So there is every reason for us to pursue that road as fast as we can. I stop there. I've spoken for a good uh, whew, uh, hour. Uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> thank but, you. Uh, yep. Thank you very much, Ambassador Picard, for the very insightful updates. Now let's go ahead and dive into our question and answer sessions. To ask your question, please use the raise hand button by clicking participants and selecting raise hand buttons. I will be choosing randomly from those who have raised their hands, please state your name and question, but do limit it to one question per person. I have seen three people raise their hands and I would like to give the floor to Tristanto from UGM. Tristanto, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for that outstanding lecture. I would like to ask one question regarding the European Union's policy on Myanmar. As I have learned from the news that 
uh, the EU is considering sanctions to be leveled on Myanmar next week. And so I would like to ask, like just a few decades ago during the previous military junta, the EU and the US also sanctioned Myanmar, but they, I think they are rather somewhat ineffective because the, the junta is still in power for decades. And so why will the EU use sanctions now again? So considering that they have been ineffective in the past. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I would like to over back to Hana from Universitas General Sudirman. Hana, please. Okay. okay. Sorry. Okay. Thank you so much for the opportunities, Kafni. My name is Hana, and I would like to personally thank you, Mr. Vincent, for your enlightening and outstanding speech about foreign policy outlook. Uh, from what I know, uh, UK had already left the European Union on 1 February 2020. And then right before Christmas on the last year, we have TCA, Trade and Cooperation Agreement. What I want to ask is, how will the European Union and the UK cooperate on foreign and security policy? And what we can do together now in a turbulent world? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Hannah. I would like to take the last question for the first page. Um, it's Jason Irman from Venus. Jason, the floor is yours. Uh, all right. Um, can you uh, hear my voice? Yes, clear. Not and clear. Okay, uh, thank you for your argument, um, Mr. Ambassador. I'm, uh, my name is Jason from Venus University. Um, I would like to ask you a question. It's a simple question, actually. In your opinion, could the European Union accumulate its foreign policy, national interests, and also trade and economic concepts in order to establish partnerships beyond the boundaries of Indo-Pacific regions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. And the floor is now yours, Mr. Ambassador. Um, well, th thank you very much um, for these three very different and good questions. Um, uh, first, the question uh, from Tristanto from uh, UGM. I believe that is Jokyakarta. Is that right? Anyhow, um, about yes, Myanmar, it is. Uh, yeah, uh, about Myanmar and, and sanctions. Uh, they didn't work uh, in during the previous junta, and uh, why try again now? Um, you know, first of all, um, the uh, we want have wanted. Uh, this has been the. the the policy choice uh, of um, of the, the high representative of the EU, Joseph Borrell, um, to promote um, and support ASEAN uh, in addressing uh, uh, the uh, the crisis in Myanmar, and um, ASEAN has been extremely active um, on the matter. The Foreign Minister of Indonesia, uh, Ivo Retno, in particular spent tremendous diplomatic capital and energy, personal energy, uh, on uh, this shuttle of diplomacy. Um, ASEAN has released statements uh, that went further than any statements in the past uh, on commenting uh, uh, the undesirable turn um, of the events in uh, in Myanmar, um, individual ASEAN members like Indonesia, but also uh, Malaysia and, and Singapore um, have made similar statements that were very, very outspoken um, um, in s criticizing uh, the military's uh, um, uh, 
takeover uh, of uh, democracy and the imprisonment of, uh, of the legally uh, uh, democratically elected leaders. Um, so our policy has, uh, has been very much to, to try and give Cha ASEAN the opportunity and chance to uh, do its work. Um, that was also the wish of ASEAN. So uh, support for ASEAN in trying to uh, resolve um, this crisis. Support also for the UN, for the special envoy. And, uh, uh, and then sanctions. Yes, uh, of course, sanctions. Um, it is one of the few hard um, and immediate uh, instruments one has in one's policy toolbox um, without resorting uh, to uh, uh, to other means. It's, it's a peaceful mean, but it is hard. It's a political statement. It is um, also a statement, um, a means that hits the interests of individuals who are directly involved in, in undesirable activity. And now, sanctions alone uh, you know it, I know it, I think everybody in this webinar knows it. Sanctions alone will not solve the problem. Uh, there is more needed uh, than that. Um, you have to uh, build up uh, together with ASEAN, with uh, uh, the international partners, a whole array of measures that make it absolutely clear uh, to the military that this is just not on. Uh, that you can't turn a legitimate, uh, law-based, um, um, hard-won uh, democracy um, in this great country, Myanmar, um, uh, uh, just like that, because you don't, don't like the result of, ele uh, of an election. Uh, that's just not on. So um, I think here the way to go forward is uh, incremental, step by step, uh, no rushed uh, decisions um, by anybody in order to try and uh, appeal to the reason uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the junta, of the uh, military in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Myanmar uh, to uh, uh, redress what they did and uh, and release the prisoners, uh, the political prisoners, and uh, restore the institutions of, um, of Myanmar's uh, uh, democracy. Um, so sanctions, you, you've got to do it, but you have to in, be very realistic about what they can achieve. Um, the second question uh, of um, Hannah from N, uh, UNSOED. Um, cooperation between the UK and the EU uh, after Brexit and um, you may be referring, you didn't say so uh, explicitly, but you may be referring to the fact that um, the, the, part, the new partnership and cooperation agreement between the EU and the UK, it provides for many things but not for foreign and security policy cooperation. Um, that was that topic. The EU had been happy, uh, keen uh, to have it in the agreement, uh, but the UK negotiator said no. Um, so uh, it means for their reason, they should <laughs> explain that. Um, but it means that we have to build a relationship with the UK in the area of foreign and security policy uh, from scratch, basically, and simply find out over time um, where our common interests are or confirm the foreign and security interests that we know and see how we can uh, move forward on that. Now, typically in diplomacy, uh, this is something that will be uh, case by case based. Um, one fantastic opportunity, of course, for us is, is the COP26 in Glasgow. 
where we and everybody uh, will wish to cooperate with the UK uh, on making that a success. And that is an evident common interest we have with the UK. Now, post normally, when you have one such case, when you have, particularly if you have a success, uh, then it um, sets the scene for, for the next one and, so, and that's the way you, you carry on. So if you ask me, my personal opinion, I'm not at all pessimistic uh, about um, foreign and security policy cooperation between the UK and the EU in the post-Brexit uh, context. We have a moment of uncertainty, of touch and go, of um, redefining who we are uh, mutually and, uh, and uh, on that basis once we have once the, uh, the smoke of the, of the brexit has, uh, has, has disappeared, then certainly uh, we can, will be able to see more clearly uh, what the common interests are and, and work on that basis. Um, Jason from Binus University. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure Binus, uh, if, if I understood your question well. Uh, but if it, I, I think it was about common interests uh, uh, amongst member states of the EU uh, for uh, relations over and above the relations in, in, in Indo, uh, the Indo-Pacific region. Um, well, I think I can answer the question um, by saying that the EU foreign ministers meet every month in Brussels, uh, chaired by uh, Joseph Borrell, a high representative. Um, to feed those meetings, uh, there are countless working groups in, in Brussels, in what we call the Council of Ministers, uh, where all the member states always meet, um, on security uh, policy, on um, regional policies on cyber, on disarmament, uh, on uh, sanctions, uh, etc. Now, that is a massive, massive mechanism for uh, for building, for identifying, and, and strengthening uh, the common in instruments, uh, common interests um, between member states. Uh, uh, on the whole, it works. Um, not perfect, nothing is perfect, but it, on the whole it works. And we, on most topics, the EU manages to, to define a uh, common position that uh, are represented by, uh, at the UN level uh, or bilaterally uh, by the, uh, the high representative. And um, now there are in certain areas, sometimes, not all time, but sometimes, um, cases where um, that is not doesn't work out, uh, there is no common position, and um, uh, doesn't happen often. But uh, uh, take take the example of the policy towards Russia, uh, where member states do take different views. Um, I won't elaborate now, but but you you can easily look that up in the. Uh, uh, in the discussion, uh, in the descriptions of the, uh, the summaries of the discussion in the foreign affairs ministers meeting uh, in the council about Russia. In, you can read that um, in the, uh, that's a good document maybe, in the, the speech um, given by High Representative Borrell uh, to the European Parliament um, on his return uh, from, from his visit to, to Moscow. Uh, about a month ago. I have a look at that and and, um, and there was a debate after that and in that debate of course you have mem members from members of parliament from all member states and you will see very clearly uh, the different perspectives um, uh, on that particular matter. Now that is a Russia will be a big topic of discussion for the next year or two. The, Depends a little bit on how developments go, but um, 
and uh, and there there will be definitely a, a big task for the uh, member states but particularly for the high representative uh, to forge forge that uh, consensus about how to take forward how much to engage what can we do with russia um, without uh, surrendering our our principles and our our values and uh, the multilateral order and the rule based uh, uh, order as as we are attached to it I hope I've answered your question, uh, Jason. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Now let's move to batch two. I've taken notes that Haikal from Airlangga University, Surabaya would like to ask question. Haikal, please, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much for the opportunity, FBCI. And good afternoon, um, Mr. Ambassador. I would like to ask, uh, what uh, is there? Is EU have any interest in partnership with uh, with the RC, RC, RCRP? Considering RCRP is currently one of the largest, if not the largest, trade bloc in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Haikal. Now I would like to invite Helen from Minus to ask her question. Um, yes, hello, am I audible? Mike. Um, okay, um, yes. thank you, Mr. Ambassador, and also for FPCI for the chance to ask uh, this question. And so as COVID-19, of course, took us all by surprise, I'm sure that it has affected the various aspects and also uh, fields of foreign policy. Um, especially in regards of the refugees currently residing in Europe. Now that the vaccines have started to be distributed, um, is there any changes to the current policy regarding refugees and what is the EU's current outlook on it? Thank you. Thank you. The last question in this batch will be from Kayaka from Venus University. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes, clear. Mr. Ambassador, my name is Kayaka from Binus. The poison that was used against Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny was the same type of Soviet nerve agent that was used against the scruples back in Salisbury in 2018, where the UK was still technically part of the EU at the time. My question is, with the clear involvement of the Russians of the two murder attempts in less than half a decade, should the EU have taken a harder stance against them? Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you may answer the question. Thank, thank you. Uh once again for these uh, interesting questions. Um, um, first of all, hi Carl from UNAIR about RCEP and uh, does the EU want to join it? Um, <laughs> two answers. Uh, first of all, it, this is a great achievement um, to bring so many different countries together in one trade um, framework um, is, is fantastic. Uh, it will facilitate trade uh, between them. It will create new opportunities. It will create income and um, uh, for everybody. And it will um, be a building block for, for whatever comes next. But that something will come next. That is, that is quite, uh, uh, quite reasonable to expect. So on the whole, the EU is, is very um, acknowledges the, the result and the success of this, this big negotiation. First time, uh, in fact, that um, all, most members of, of RCEP negotiated an agreement of, of this size with this many uh, other countries uh, uh, at regional level. Secondly, uh, about the EU joining it, no, I don't think so. Uh, because um, our approach uh, to uh, 
trade with uh, with Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, is at a, for the time being bilateral. Um, we have already signed uh, agreements and agreements with uh, that are in in uh, in force um, with Japan, with uh, South Korea, with Singapore, with Vietnam. Um, so those are four big ones. Um, we have um, a, a negotiation in, in motion uh, with Australia, with New Zealand, with um, uh, Indonesia, of course. Others may come, um, Malaysia, um, Thailand. Um, but um, that's our agreements, uh, our negotiations, our ex uh, sorry, the existing agreements we have with those countries and the ones that we are negotiating go a lot further than RCEP. Uh, so there is for us, in other words, uh, no economic or practical use in joining uh, RCEP. And um, so we, for the time being, we pursue this bilateral track, uh, creating a host of um, agreements uh, with the major economies of, um, of Asia and Southeast Asia. And with, at a later point in time, I don't know when, uh, the possibility of um, a region to region uh, FTA between ASEAN and the EU, ASEAN as a whole, and the uh, EU. We're not there yet, um, uh, but uh, certainly for us politically, uh, that would be an interest. So positive on the RCEP without us intending or uh, seeing the use uh, uh, for us uh, as EU to join, join it. Second question, uh, uh, Helen um, from Venus. Um, COVID, refugees, uh, vaccination, uh, interface. And, um, I, yeah, let's put it this way. First of all, vaccination, the EU is, is vaccinating anybody and everybody um, on our territory, regardless of where they are from or who they are. Uh, so the EU nationals, but also uh, Indonesian residents uh, or other residents, foreign residents in the EU, and also um, um, refugees, um, um, ref regular refugees, but even irregular um, migrants. Um, and that vaccination is inclusive for, of everybody. Um, large, I think in most cases, if not all cases, free of charge. And the, the reason is very simple, and that is uh, the medical common sense. And that, you know, it's, it's, if you want to vaccinate 70% uh, uh, of adult population, uh, then you, you can't look at the passport of somebody. You have to vaccinate, uh, full stop. And um, otherwise, you, you, you don't have the results you, you get. Uh, so, um, and in other words, the refugees, uh, wherever they are, uh, or uh, irregular migrants, wherever they are, will also be able to benefit um, from the vaccination policy, following the same um, priority setting uh, for you know the elderly and, and the vulnerable and uh, uh, etc. Like like you have in in Indonesia. Um, I don't think that um, the COVID crisis has changed our policy on refugees uh, or on migration as such. Uh, what we have seen is that uh, the number of uh, refugees uh, uh, coming to Europe has gone down. Uh, and the same for irregular migrants. Um, clearly, um, COVID uh, has hindered a movement and it goes uh, for... Uh, for us uh, sitting sitting here, uh, but also for refugees. So in that sense, uh, uh, there has not been a major change in our policy, but rather continuity. Uh, 
have a look at the um, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, the European uh, Commission and the High Representative published a new policy paper on what we call the Southern Neighbourhood. Uh, so the countries from uh, from Morocco, uh, um, Algeria, Tunisia, um, and uh, up to Egypt, uh, but also the Middle East. Have a look at that policy paper. There is um, attention there for the topic of migration uh, in the present framework and, uh, and what the EU uh, intends to do um, in our approach. Um, then the third question from Kayaka, also from Bimers University, uh, with the beautiful clouds in your back. Um, the, uh, I didn't catch the last couple of words of your question. Um, so I'm not 100% sure. Maybe you repeat it, uh, uh, Kayaka, if, if uh, uh, Afni allows. Yes, Kayaka. Uh, uh, my question is, with the clear involvement of the Russians uh, of the two murder attempts in less than half a decade, should the EU have taken a harder stance against them? Thank you. Um, well, I think I think our position has been has been pretty tough, um, and um, but first of all, to um, agree with you that uh, these are two outrageous cases of um, um, you know uh, of uh, agents, whoever they are. Um, trying to kill um, um, civilians uh, who are um, disliked uh, uh, by uh, uh, the rulers, uh, clear cases that this is a, a form of state aggression that, that we can, can only um, reject completely. Um, secondly, I, I do think that um, the EU is, is very firm in, in its reaction to it. Uh, we have issued the sanctions um, uh, on the first case, Skripal, uh, um, and also on the second case of uh, Mr. Navalny. Um, we have expanded the sanctions um, um, after uh, on putting more sanctions on top of the existing ones, the more people um, and uh, and uh, yeah, so I think we've done what we could. Um, uh, if it comes to that, secondly, uh, it's our political position. Um, there's a big price. Uh, uh, that is a message to uh, to the our, uh, to Russia, the Russian authorities. There's a very big price that you're paying um, uh, for such actions. If, if you put yourself outside. Uh, uh, the law uh, in this sort of way, um, you're, you're harming your relations with the European Union. Uh, now, if you, uh, can do, Russia do without it? Maybe for a little while, yes. Uh, but not for good, uh, that's for sure. Uh, so uh, if we miss uh, the relations with Russia, then I'm sure Russia misses them even more than we are. Do uh, because we are, they're more dependent on us and uh, their alternatives are fewer. Uh, so I, I do think that um, the political messaging combined with sanctions, uh, the trade uh, sanctions as well, um, uh, are powerful and, uh, and will in due course uh, uh, lead to a, a, an opening uh, on, on the Russian side, at least that's very much what, what we are after, because we that is one I want to stress once again that EU member states uh, want to rebuild uh, relations with Russia um, the moment when the condition allows. Allow. Um, thank you, Ambassador. 
Now I'm opening to the third batch of our question and answer session, which is probably the last batch. Is there anyone who would like to ask Ambassador Picat? Okay, I saw Lalu Ladeva from Brawijaya University and Dinda from Brawijaya University as well. The first floor I give to Lalu. Yes, uh, thank you so much for the opportunities. So I would like to ask a question to the ambassador. So regarding to the regional conflict that happens in the European continent, which takes place uh, between Russia and Ukraine and Russia and Georgia, uh, what has uh, European Union see themselves uh, in this conflict? Like, I know that Russia nor, nor Georgia is part of the European Union, but since this conflict is happening in the European continent, does uh, European Union saw themselves uh, there is a potential that they will go in as possible negotiators between these two partisans. Because as of right now, there seem like there is no agreement has been made yet to settle the conflict between these two partisans. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lalu. I would like to call upon Dinda, please. Hello, uh, can you hear my voice? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, hello, Mr. Ambassador. My name is Dinda. First of all, thank you for the enlightening lecture you've give us this afternoon. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, does the EU have any views on maybe changing the world uh, into a more bipolar rather than multipolar? Because uh, from what I know, multipolar powers gives more potential of creating chaos uh, within the world compared to bipolar. And do you think the EU has uh, a potential to become one of those bipolar powers? Thank you. Thank you, Dina. And due to the time constraints, I will take those two questions and let the ambassador answer. Please, ambassador. Thank you. Um, uh, Lalu from UOB. Um, um, your role in the Russia-Ukraine uh, dispute and the Russia-Georgia. Um, on Georgia, it's, um, the answer is a simple yes. Um, we are sending a, a special envoy uh, to uh, uh, to Georgia, uh, who necessarily will also be visiting um, uh, Moscow and um, and other interested parties um, to try and uh, and mediate um, uh, a the conflict standoff there, and um, so that is one thing uh, for Russia Ukraine uh, there is this uh, standing group um, I forget the name now uh, the St. Malo group if I'm not mistaken uh, the, the town in France where the first uh, summit happened um, between um, um, the uh, Russian uh, leader and the Ukrainian uh, shortly after the, um, and the annexation and the war in Ukraine happened. Uh, so that's the, that's the platform uh, for negotiation. And um, the sorry thing to note is that that platform hasn't been very active and uh, there is at the moment little uh, perspective on, on any, any breakthrough uh, in that matter. And um, whether it concerns the... Uh, um, the uh, um, the part of uh, Ukraine in the eastern Ukraine, or whether it concerns um, the Crimea, uh, particularly. So uh, we, we see uh, a risk here of a, of a long-lasting standstill. Um, what the EU is doing, of course, is continuing to raise the matter with uh, uh, with the Russian authorities. Uh, the High Representative did so 
in Moscow uh, last month with little success, I, I, uh, with little forthcomingness uh, from the side of the, uh, of the Russian foreign minister. <clears throat> but, uh, but, but, but there you are. Um, um, the other work we do, of course, is work very closely with the, uh, 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 the government, the authorities of, of Ukraine, as well as of those of Georgia, uh, with a very, very significant financial support uh, to both countries uh, for um, strengthening their economies, for job creation, for um, institutional development, fighting corruption, uh, and things like that. Uh, so, certainly with the aim of, uh, of giving both Ukraine and, um, and Georgia uh, the best possible starting position uh, to uh, uh, shape their own uh, destinies. Um, Linda, uh, from U UB, um, um, multipolar versus bipolar. Uh, I like your question a lot. Um, it, it, however, uh, let's go back in time a little bit. Um, in uh, up to 1989, we had a bipolar world, uh, uh, Soviet Union versus the United States, um, with uh, Europe somewhat uncomfortably um, sitting there in the middle. And, um, and much of the rest of the world was, was an adjunct of that bipolar uh, standoff, the rivalry. Um, in many countries in South America, of course, strongly aligning either with um, <coughs> the United States uh, or with the Soviet Union, read Cuba, um, and, and similar um, um, formations in Asia with, of course, and that's of course something certainly one should mention in, in Indonesia, uh, Indonesia as a lead agent behind the non-aligned movement um, uh, started in uh, or set up in Bandung uh, in a hotel where I had the pleasure of sleeping one, one time um, uh, before COVID. I hope to do it again. And um, so that, that is over and uh, I th bipolarity in, for the future, you know, two things. Um, I think the days are over where um, a handful of people, whoever they are, uh, can say, we're going to do it like this. And uh, you belong there. Uh, a border is drawn here and not there. And, um, and um, this is your sphere. And this is uh, my sphere of influence. Um, so I think that that reality simply doesn't exist any longer in which that were possible. And, and the second thing is, you know, who, who would be um, uh, this bipolarity? Um, who would be the two poles? And, and uh, uh, I don't think uh, there would be an easy agreement on that. Certainly some, some would claim it, uh, but I don't think that that is a set uh, even for them, a realistic answer to uh, the world in which they find themselves, especially because if you have a bipolarity, there's a host of countries, large countries. Uh, I've mentioned some of them in um, uh, India, Indonesia, the, the EU, uh, that may not find themselves in, in that bipolarity and, and they don't want to decide uh, to choose between whoever are the two poles. I feel it very strongly in here in Indonesia. You talk to people and when you listen to uh, uh, the government, the foreign minister, um, a, an independent foreign policy for Indonesia, um, maintaining relations with the two big rivals, if you like, uh, China and United States at the same time uh, on the basis of mutual respect and uh, equal partnerships and, and so on. And so Indonesia definitely doesn't want to choose because 
it needs both partners for uh, its own um, independence, its sovereignty, for its own ability to develop the economy, uh, the economic relations. It needs China, it needs the US as well, it needs Europe uh, and, uh, and vice versa. So I, I think that um, multipolarity will be uh, the format uh, for as far as we can look into the future. And the question is more, uh, how easily and how strongly uh, the multipolar uh, partners can, um, can uh, commit themselves to strengthening the multilateral framework. Uh, very concretely, the WTO. Uh, we need the WTO, everybody does it. Uh, there's no alternative, but as it is now, it won't work because uh, we have a number of serious issues about some of the rules that are simply not uh, realistic in the current economic context. Uh, so I think that is more the question for the future. Can the multipolar partners uh, come to a sense of urgency and, um, and consensus on how to take them? the multilateral system, a multilateral organization, WTO, the UN, WHO, what have you, um, to strengthen them for dealing with the global issues. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I think we should cut it here. And I'm sure everyone has many questions, but unfortunately we have to stop here due to to time constraints. Thank you, Ambassador. And thank you, all of the students who have joined today's discussion. That was a very thoughtful discussion. And I believe that all of us here have, have learned a lot about European Union. As a closing statement, is there a message that you would like to convey, Ambassador? My message number one is, uh... Um, stay healthy, be careful for yourselves, for your dependents, for your families, for your fellow students. This the crisis will be, the pandemic will be with us for some time to come. We have to be patient and strong, each of us individually and as a group. So that, that is my message to you and my wish to you at the same time. And I do hope, as I said, to visit all 12 universities in the course of my mandate here in, in Indonesia. Thank you very much for your interest. I really appreciate it. Thank do look at, our, look, look at our website, the website of the EU delegation with all the uh, social media um, um, uh, accounts and, uh, and so on for staying up to date. My Twitter. Sure. Yes. Apparently we will not end here because I received words that the EU delegation has actually prepared a fun quiz for us. Oh. Yes. I hope ambassador could stay a bit longer. There are only going to be three questions and they are multiple choice. To answer, please use the raise hand feature and I will choose randomly from that. If you answer the questions correctly, you will be receiving a goodie bag with cool gifts and prizes. So now let's begin. Quiz number one. The Nobel, Pro the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to the European Union for advancing the causes of peace, reconciliation, democracy, and human rights in Europe. The prize was conferred in Oslo. Like all winners, the EU received the prize from the chairman of the Norwegian Nobel Committee. The EU was represented by the president of the European Council the President of the European Commission, and the President of the European Parliament. The question is, when did the EU become a Nobel laureate? A, in 2015, B, in 1992, or C, in 2012? Okay. 
I saw the first one raise her hand is Brina Kalista from Jakarta. Hello, am I audible? Yes. The yes. is 2012. Is that correct, Ambassador? That's correct. Okay, congratulations, hey. Brina. Thank you. Now let's move on to the second quiz. I'll be reading the question. The European Parliament is the legislative branch of the EU and one of its seven institutions. Its members are directly elected by EU citizens every five years. The members of the European Parliament or MEPs sit in political groups. They are not organized by nationality, but by political affiliation. Currently, there are seven political groups in the European Parliament. The question is, how many MEPs are there? A, 705 members, B, 502 members, or C, 1,003 members. Okay, I saw the first one raising his hand, Haikal from UNAIR. Yes, uh, the answer oh, is the answer? Uh, answer is 705. <laughs> what about that answer? Okay, thank you, Ambassador. It's correct. Last quiz. <laughs> the European Union has secured up to 2.6 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccine so far for EU countries and negotiations are underway for additional doses. Vaccine deliveries to EU countries have increased steadily and vaccination is gathering peace. The EU is also committed to ensuring that safe vaccines reach all corners of the world. Team Europe, comprising of the EU, its member states and financial institutions have pledged over 2.2 billion euros to COVAX, the global initiative aimed at ensuring equitable access to COVID-19 vaccine. The question is, what are the four vaccines that have been granted conditional marketing authorization across the EU? A, BioNTech Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Sinovac, and Novavax, or B, BioNTech Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, and Janssen and & Janssen, or C, Sputnik, Sinovac, AstraZeneca, and Moderna. Is there anyone? Okay, Tristanto. I think the answer is B, uh, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, and the Johnson & Johnson. <laughs> is it correct, Ambassador? Congratulations, yes. Tristanto. Yes. Hey. Congratulations to all the winners. We will be sending the gifts to you. And now we have come to the end of the session, which will we have a virtual group photo shoot for the ambassadorial lecture. Please turn on your camera and make a good pose. Um, I'll be counting in three. Is the camera ready? Three, two, one. Once again, ready? Three, two, one. Oh, I, there is a request once again. So in three, two, one. Thank you, thank you very much. With that, we have come to the end of our ambassador lecture today. Thank you so much, Ambassador. On behalf of FPCI and the audience here today, I would like to extend our gratitude to Ambassador Vincent Picat, the delegation of the European Union to Indonesia, and all the students who have joined today's discussion. 
thank you for everyone. Stay safe and stay healthy. See you in the next lecture. Terima kasih banyak to everybody. Take Terima care. Kasih, All the, thank you. All the best. All the best. Thank you very much, Please sir. Thank you. thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir.